What's one rule of tennis that you change? You're not going to like it. Only one serve. Okay, let's scrap that. Welcome to Hanakuma's Good Trouble. It's no surprise I've been known for getting in a bit of trouble right here on this court, but trouble can be a good thing. I've been able to take those lessons and use them for good with my new show at Hanakuma, Good Trouble with Nick Kyrgios. Today, I'm sitting with one of the tennis legendary minds, Patrick Muratoglu, AKA the mentalist, the coach, and the mastermind. From behind the scenes to TV screens, you've seen him on documentaries, covering matches, and giving advice to online fans and players, myself included. He's the founder of the UTS and the top tennis academy in the world. A winner of 39 singles titles, 10 Grand Slams, Junior Grand Slams, three WTA Tour Championships, two gold medals, and four Coach of the Year awards alongside Serena, Holger Rune, Simona Halep, Stefanos Tsitsipas, and Coco Goff. Patrick, welcome to the show. Thank you, Nick. What does good trouble mean to you? Uh, I mean, that's two words that are not supposed to work well together, but I think they do. Uh, trouble is something that is very necessary, I think. Uh, it's kind of pushing the boundaries, doing things that are unusual, uh, provo provoking sometimes. But the good trouble means that you do it for a reason. You, just, you don't provoke just to provoke, you provoke to make things move. And if you don't do that, the world is standing still and I think we need to make it w work better. We need to evolve and in tennis, it makes a lot of sense. Mm. So let's just go into your journey a little bit. You know, me as a kid, you know, coming into tennis, I ne was never really comfortable. You know, I was pretty insecure about, you know, the way I looked. And for you, I've heard that you were a super quiet kid. And now I don't get that vibe at all. So how, how has that changed? Yeah, I, I was more than quiet. I was completely unable to talk to anyone. And honestly, I was scared that someone would talk to me because I knew I would completely freeze and I would be unable to answer anything back. So I spent... Uh, around 20 years of my life uh, being alone, being unable to talk to people, being bullied a lot, mm. because when you are weak, kids are tough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and one day I decided to change. I mean, it's more complicated than that, of course, but uh, I worked on myself. I went to see a therapist. I did uh, eight years of psychotherapy. For the first year, I couldn't say one word to the guy, not one word. I was going wow. every single week and I couldn't speak just to say how bad it was. And uh, I think it's a good lesson for everyone because when you decide to change and you, you're courageous enough to do what you have to do, then you make, can make your life different. And for sure, my life became different from that day. And you know, I'm asked many times, what are you the most proud of, uh, all your achievements? And I say, I'm just proud of one thing, that I changed the kid that I was into the man I was when I was around 26. Because afterwards, when you are confident, when you, when you know how to interact with people, mm. when you feel that you're able to achieve your goals, I'm not saying things are not difficult, it takes a lot of work, etc. but it's, you're ready for life. You know, every time you do all these amazing things, I see you on social media, I see you coaching all these amazing players, always trying to help fans, players worldwide. Is there anything that you carry with yourself that was one thing that's in your back of your mind? I've heard only negative things about me as a kid because again, I was bad at school, not interacting with people and I was judged by everyone. And one day someone said something positive about me and this changed my life. Um, I mean, it was a teacher and he said to my parents, your son is very, he's always somewhere else during, during class, so probably he's gonna have a job that is very creative. And the guy saw exactly the same as everyone, but he, he saw it in a positive mm. way. And it's the first time someone uh, looked at me with a positive eye, and uh, this is also how I coach. I look, at, I look with a kind eye mm. at people in general, but even more when it comes to my player, I see the positive in them. Whereas if you listen to a lot of guys, they just, you ask them, what about your player? And the first thing they say Negative. is, well, the problem is, I don't ask you for the problem, I ask, tell me about your player. The problem is, that's how they start. So I think it's very important. You know, you, I've seen some of the things you say about me, you know, you look at the majority of the tennis world and they're always saying, what I can improve on, what's wrong with my game, what's wrong with my personality. But you, it's always like, you say it in a different way, and I, I noticed that, and you know I appreciate that. But I, even when I'm, you know, I'm doing a bit of commentating now, and I'm, I'm I think I'm the same. I, I I watch these players, and I see these people going through 
problems on the court and I, I understand how hard it is at the time and I think that's the special thing about speaking with people. Everyone's got a crazy journey. Like I had no idea that you were struggling for so many years with not even being able to talk and now to see where you are today, that's it's pretty special. In my life especially, I just, all I can remember was negativity to be honest. I remember in the academy, I was the worst physical sort of specimen we had. You know, we did all these testing, jump tests, speed tests, change of direction and it was horrible. Like I was so embarrassed. Sometimes I would fake stomach aches to not do, you know, tests and I just didn't want to do it. And I remember coaches saying, if you're not even able to do this, then you shouldn't even try to become a tennis player. And those are the only things that I remember. I just remember these negative sort of things and they stick with you forever. But I guess just winning kind of helped that. You know, I was just like, I always just tell them like, I'm winning, so it doesn't really matter what I'm doing here, but that's special. It's interesting, by the way, if you see a match that is very close, I mean, you win two points, you win the match, you lose those two points, you lose the match. Mm. The comments are going to be completely opposite whether you lose or win those two points. If you lose those two points, I mean, the guy is out of shape, he's not ready. Yeah. You win those two points, you're a genius. Yeah. That's incredible. There is no balance. People are so fast to judge you and bury you yeah. <laughs> in two minutes. And again, it's about having a kind eye. And you have a kind eye because you understand what the players go through when they play those matches. Obviously, that Wimbledon final with Novak in 2022, I think, you know, you said two points can change a match. Like that for me, do you think if I'd won that, the whole narrative would change on this? For sure. You would be a Grand Slam winner. Uh, nobody would say that you, you are wasting your talent. <laughs> I mean, if, and, and we're talking about one match. And it, I already knew the answer to this question, by the way. I knew that everything would change. Um, but it's crazy because I was only you know, a set and a half away yeah. from, from winning and, and I guess becoming tennis immortality. You win a Grand Slam, no one, no one cares about what you do anymore. Um, yeah, that sucks. It's not over. The journey is not over. It's not over. It, it's not over, but I'm just saying, like, I would have loved to just sit here and being a Grand Slam champion would have been nice. And now I'm still the talented we, Nikira. We'll do another podcast when you are. <laughs> So we'll, we'll talk about coaching a little bit. What about it? You know, you said that you've got a kind eye, you love to watch and observe. What gives you that ability to, to watch the game of tennis and help people so well? You know, the power of observation. What's, you know, is that, does everyone have that or do you have something special? I don't know if I have something special, but I know I spent a lot, a lot of time watching and listening because, again, I couldn't talk. When you can talk with people, you know, if you look at people, what they do during the day, they spend the immense majority of the day talking to other people. Mm. My whole day, I was listening and I was watching people. And after, I was watching tennis. Uh, and I was watching with so much attention because I was so passionate about the game. And sometimes I was seeing things and I was saying it to people and it, I, I understood they were not seeing it. It was nothing incredible. For me, it was something that was obvious, but they don't see it because I think they don't look at it with as much attention as they should. Mm. Uh, so it's the passion. People who are passionate, they often... Uh, uh, see more things because they're more into what they're looking at. And years later, when I, I stopped playing tennis, mm. uh, I remember I was working in a company, and at lunchtime I was going to a club, and I was watching the courts. And there was <laughs> nobody was playing, but I think when I say that, I, I realize I look really uh, nuts. <laughs> but I was watching the courts, and I was imagining guys playing and strategies and things like this. I was always passionate about this game. And one of the reasons is because uh, that's the only place I felt good. Mm. I felt bad everywhere because I had no confidence and I was scared of people. But on a tennis court, I was feeling felt good, safe. safe, good at something. I was good at nothing. I was terrible at school. Mm. I was good at something, so people were seeing me different. Uh, so I wanted to be on the tennis court all day long and I was spending all my day, uh, every time I could, I was on a tennis court. People will probably ask you about Serena all the time. And for me, I think when you were part of her historic, you know, return and in 2018 when you were, you know, giving her a little bit of, you know, to everyone else it was like, oh, you were coaching her, you're doing this. But to the players there, you doing this is not really, doesn't help a player that much. If, if, if they're not able to execute and deal with the pressure, d d helping your player a little bit. And now they've completely changed the rule that you're allowed to coach and say whatever. So it even looks more ridiculous that you got caught up for something so small. So what is your overall opinion on you know, coaching on court, not coaching, like, because I hate it. I think one of the greatest aspects of tennis was 
going out there for potentially, you know, for women three hours and for, for the men five hours, being on your own, figuring it out. I think there's no better thing than seeing someone, you know, lose two sets and then figure it out in their head. Like, I'm about to figure this out and win it and then come back and win. I've done it a couple of times in my career and it's the best feeling. And I think now tennis has lost that aspect. It was the only sport that, you know, you had to watch someone helpless. There was nowhere to hide and now they've kind of lost that. So I want to get your thoughts on that mm -hmm. because that's, that's you're, the, you're, the, you're the king of it. So 2019, I was in good trouble. Yes. <laughs> it was a terrible day for us uh, because all the drama around the US Open final. Uh, it was a bad day, in a, a, I mean, a bittersweet day, I think, for Naomi because mm. her first Grand Slam, but yeah, the attention. there was such a drama that this drama took even more, uh, people had more attention on the drama than for, for I mean, in a way. Uh, so I think it was not for, I mean, not the ideal first Grand Slam for Naomi. Um, for us, it was really painful, mm. and uh, and yeah, and we had a lot of bad press. <laughs> uh, so I know what that feels like. Yeah, exactly. But I think it was a good thing for two reasons. First of all, uh, the drama was so big because it was a Grand Slam final and it was Serena that all the media all around the world, even media that were not sports media, were talking about tennis. So yep. for tennis, it was a great day, and I think we need drama just draw more attention to the game. And uh, second, uh, I think it participated into the discussion to change the rule. I know mm. you, you, you wouldn't like the rule to change, but I think the rule had to change because m maybe you were not using it, but most of the players were getting so much coached mm. at every single match. And you probably know it because you've been against guys yeah, who were getting a lot of coaching. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we're not gonna name anybody. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, fun. better than to do it, uh, I understand your point, that uh, it's the only sport in which the players have to figure it out by themselves. And I understand that it can be exciting for the players and, uh, and look good, but I think that coaching is such a big part of sports. Mm. I think moments of coaching can be so great, and when WTA also uh, allowed the, the coaches to go on court, I've seen some coaching moments that were incredible. Yeah. For the fans, I think it's great because they have more insight. They understand the player's emotion better mm -hmm. because they can talk also. I think it's great moments and I, I, I think they should be, uh, coaches should have microphones, they should be on TV uh, because it's part of the game. In all the other sports, we like those coaching moments. You like basketball, you like the coaching moments, I'm sure, no? Yeah. Don't you? But you have your teammates too, you know, it's already part of the, you know, it's part of the sport, you know, but like, I just think tennis for me sometimes, because some players can't afford coaches. You know, not, not every player can, you know, travel full time with a coach as well. So I feel like sport should be even on every sort of aspect, you know. So I don't think I'm ever going to like that rule. But yeah, I know a lot we of players. We agree to disagree. Yeah, yeah. Fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. So if I wanted to have a coach, what would you tell me? What, what are some advice you would tell me? Because this is, I think the world wants to know, you know, you got the, the, the coach teaching the player who is refusing to have a coach. What would you tell me? I feel you have what I call the syndrome of the talented player. And I'm gonna explain what, it, what I mean by that. So probably since you're a kid, everyone says to you that you're very talented. So now it's part of you, it's part of your identity to be talented. And the question is for someone like you is, are you prepared to potentially lose a piece of your identity to be talented, to be a champion? But you're not sure you'll be a, you'll be a champion. So that's exactly, I think, the battle that is inside you is, do I take the risk to lose my identity as a talented player? Because if I really try and I don't make it, maybe I'm not talented. That's a big risk. And it's tough. And I understand that, uh, that battle inside. I, I've worked with other talented players. Mm -hmm. I worked with Grigor, for yeah. example, who's been told also the same. And all these bad attitudes, I mean, what people call bad attitudes, mm. uh, tanking matches, not fighting, not working, or not working really fully, doing things halfway, are... If you look at the players who do that, it's only talented players, and that's the reason why. Because, in a way, they keep their identity as being talented, mm. whereas if they do everything right and it doesn't work, maybe they lose it. Interesting. Interesting. I've never heard this before. When people say, you know, you're talented and, you know, you haven't had to work as hard, you know, I look back at my journey and I think, like, you know, I was one of the hardest workers in the academy when we were here in Melbourne. Like, I was here, like, five, six hours a day, two sessions, gym, and I felt like I was a harder worker than most of the people in here. 
And I think just obviously what I did off the court didn't show that, you know, to the fans and, you know, how I am, you know, in general, I'm very relaxed. I don't take myself too seriously. I think, oh, he doesn't work hard. But I feel like when I'm on court, you know, I'm working pretty hard. So I would like to lose that. Like, I don't like going around and only people thinking, oh, he's just one of the most talented players ever. I still have to deal with it. I go on social media and it's like, oh, he's a waste of talent. It's like, I don't like want to have that title, but it's definitely an interesting, an interesting way to think. Of. I've never thought about it that way before. And, and the core of this is people, when people don't do everything to succeed, mm. uh, the reason for that is the fear of failure, whether we're talking about tennis or anything in life. Mm. People, and it's something that is completely understandable. I mean, everybody's uh, scared to, to fail. And the fear of failure is completely linked with the confidence you have in your ability to do things. Mm. So if the confidence is not high enough, you have a, a strong fear of failure and you have something big to lose, your talent, mm -hmm. then it's difficult to do things the right way. And I understand. And that's my job. My job is to help people go through that journey that is a tough one. But I, it's important for the, for the coach to understand what the players go through. If he doesn't, he's going to judge all the time and say, this is wrong, you should do this, you should do that. I don't think it leads very, very far. You know, Tsitsipas, you know, mentioned, you know, that, that match at Wimbledon saying that he brings a basketball mentality to the sport. And for me, you know, I grew up, I idolized basketball. I watched NBA every day. I still do to this day. And I just, it was part of my, I felt part of that culture. I felt like the way they dress, the way they act, it just felt, I felt super comfortable, just like you feel safe on the tennis court. I feel super safe on the basketball court with people that love basketball. So for you, you know, I kind of felt like I bridged the gap between tennis and basketball. You know, obviously had the shoe with Kyrie and wearing basketball jerseys, and then everyone's now wearing basketball jerseys on the court. But for you, I feel like there hasn't been a coach that has taken what you've done on social media or the, for the fans. You've made it very interactive with the UTS. You know, that has been something for me that I've been a part of. I, I think it's awesome. You know, when I was in Los Angeles, I was watching that. It was incredible. And I feel like we've both had criticism for maybe stepping outside of what conventional tennis coach should be like or a conventional tennis player should be like. How have you dealt with that? And how do you wake up every day and stay true to what you want to do? You know, helping players around the world, academies, UTS, where most coaches would be like, oh, that, like, we're not supposed to be doing that type of stuff. Yeah, you're right. I mean, we, we, we've been criticized, both of us, for stepping out of what people usually do. Mm. And, uh, I mean, the world is like that. If you don't follow everybody's uh, path and you try to do something new or different, people at the start don't like it. But one day they start to like it. I think it's very important not to give too much attention to people who criticize you because there will always be anyway. Uh, it's important to put it in balance with, with people who love you and the people who hate you on social media, if they cross you to, in five minutes when you go out, of, they're going to ask you for an autograph and a picture. <laughs> so, is this true? <laughs> it's true. So yeah, uh, one of the advice, I don't give too many, but one very important one for, for players is be careful who's around you. Don't have people who judge you around you because this is going to kill you. Have positive people who look at you with a kind eye. I think it's very important. I think I know your team and I know people look at you this way and that's why you, you like to be around them. Mm. Uh, and of course, people will also criticize this and say, oh, he wants only people who tell him what he wants to hear. No, I want people who see me with a kind eye. Mm. I want the same. Mm. So I'm hearing rumblings of an academy coming and you know, what's your goal? for that academy, you know, as a businessman, but also as a coach, like what, tell me a bit about that. Uh, so I started my academy in the previous century, mm -hmm. 1996. And a year I, after I was born. Exactly. Mm. And um, I started with renting two courts in a club, literally. So I really started from the very, very bottom. And uh, my goal has always been to help players become top professionals because I didn't, nobody gave me the chance. Mm. And this big, big frustration, and I know it's something you want to talk about, became the, the reason for me to, I mean, it became a big motor for me to do things. My tennis academy is helping young players become professionals um, through a tennis and school program, which I believe a lot in because I think it's unbelievable to, to put together a school and sport at a good level, mm. I think. Uh, those people are prepared for life better than anyone and much better than people who do only school, believe yeah. me. Yeah. So I, I, I really, really want this to become something that 
is spread all around the world. That's why I opened uh, many uh, tennis centers. And, uh, and this one in, uh, in Australia, I'm excited because it's big. It's going to be as big as the one I have in south of France, which is the biggest in Europe. Awesome. Uh, I still haven't been invited, by the way. Just going to let everyone know that. You I've have never an, been there you before. Ha you have an official invitation. Thank you. <laughs> But I think with, with, with uh, the Murato Glue Academy here, we'll be able to work together and probably reach out to many more kids mm. and give many more kids a chance. So that's what's exciting. And I think we can, we can really uh, be part of the, of the people who help the young players become, become top pros and Australian champions. As one of the best tennis coaches in tennis, is there any athlete in the world who doesn't play that you wish you could coach tennis to? Mike Tyson. <laughs> really? I mean, imagine how he's going to hit the ball. Yeah, I know, but is he, does he have the coordination? Actually, I'm, actually, I'm, you know what, Mike, you've got the coordination. I'm not going to say anything bad <laughs> at all. You're taking a lot of risk yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Mike Tyson? Yes. Okay, who do you think is the most naturally gifted tennis player? I've got my mm -hmm. opinion. I think it's Roger Federer by far. I think to watch, I don't think we'll ever see someone as naturally gifted. I think if we're talking about the greatest, I think it's Novak, but most talented, talented, there's that word, I'll say Roger, what about you? Oh, not even a discussion. Roger is by far the most talented, coordinated, elegant tennis player. And I, I said several times, no, I think nobody will ever play tennis the way Roger did. I don't think it's possible. Mm. And out of the young guys coming up, you know, that young group of guys, who do you think has the best style and why? Style, you mean style or style no, no, uh, tennis? No, style, I mean tennis. Tennis. I think if we talk only about tennis, Sinner. Mm. He, the way he hits the ball, his timing, uh, his ability to never move back, for me is, a, is an Agassi but modern mm. in the style. Yeah. Because the guy never steps back. Because, ball striking is amazing. Oh, ball striking is a joke. He cuts the trajectories all the time. He, he plays so fast. And you, it looks normal when he does it. It doesn't look like an effort. Mm. Now it's not only about tennis to be a champion, as you know, yep. but uh, tennis-wise, I think he's the most impressive. Who's the most mentally resilient athlete you've ever seen? I mean, I think it's hard to go past Rafa. Yeah, uh, I agree. The more, res the, the more resilient is Rafa. Uh, I think Novak is not far behind, mm. even though he doesn't have the same attitude, and I think this plays a role in the fact that he's not given this uh, qualification of being resilient mm. that much, but I think I mean, he's incredibly resilient too. <laughs> but Rafa is, uh, is definitely, to win so many Rangeros, if you're not resilient, it's impossible. Mm. So yeah, he's the most resilient. So as a coach and as you observe and you watch, I'm sure you've watched all the players on tour, all the best players on tour, who's got the worst tick? Like who's got the biggest like, like, oh, he's going to do this now. Like, who, who's got, like, who shows their hand under pressure the most? Like, who, like oh, what's this, one habit okay. that you know that someone does? Oh, that's a good question. Because I'm sure that you've seen, like, oh, he does that all the time when he's a bit nervous. Or, yeah, you know yeah for I mean? sure. Yeah. I more see uh, people getting tight, uh, and you see it with the, their technique that is changing. Novak, Novak, I see it. His technique is changing when he's tight. Mm. It's very, very obvious. Uh, I'm watching with, with other people and they say, oh, he's rolling. I said, no, look, he's getting tight now. And they don't see it because they don't look. Mm. But yeah, so I see it on the technique. Do they do something out of the, in between the points that uh, make people uh, see them nervous? Uh, What's my take? Like when, when you say me... Oh, you start to talk with your, your box. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to say when you start to talk to yourself after the first game? <laughs> Are you talking about box? Yeah, I talk. Yeah. Talking. Who's the goat? There is no discussion about I don't understand why we discuss the goat. I like it. The goat is the biggest achievement in, in sports. Mm. Biggest achievement in tennis is Novak Djokovic. There is no discussion. I understand the discussion about who do you prefer, <laughs> uh, but who's the goat? The guy who has the most uh, Grand Slam titles. And actually, he doesn't have only that. He has so many other records. Yeah. So, and, he's, and he's the one that is still fit. Yep. So he's going to score many other, I'm, I'm sure about it. But even if it stops tomorrow, the GOAT is the one who has the biggest achievement. All right. What's one rule of tennis that you change? Uh, it depends if it's an important rule or small things. There important are a lot of rule. Important like what's, rule. What's one thing? You're not going to like it. Only one serve. 
okay, let's scrap that. That's why. Oh, for a simple reason. Because if you look at the tennis match, mm. uh, the time when the ball is in play is extremely small. It's between yes. 8% and 20% of the time. Yeah, it's so like the average shots, like two and a, the average rally is like two and a half balls, right? Something crazy. But because of the aces and the serve winners, not only, but a lot. A lot of because of this. And serve plus one. Most of, and I I'm going to lose my job if I have No, because your second, <laughs> I think you have the best second serve on tour. Yeah, I know, but first serve is pretty good. <laughs> That's true too. <laughs> but you know, surprisingly, when you don't have a when you're a champion and you are when you don't have a shot, you find other ways to win. Yeah, that's true. You know, and I'm, I don't want to compare you with anyone, but uh, last UTS, Jack Draper won, and nobody would think he would win because his serve is such a big asset, mm. and he played unbelievable tennis from the baseline. And I said to my guys, is, this is going to be helping him so much during mm, the season time. because now he knows he can beat those guys. He beat Rublev, he beat uh, from Holger the back of the court. from the back of the court. Wow. So I think for the fans to have more rallies, less uh, serve winner aces or serve plus one would make the game more, uh, I mean, more interesting, I think. And also more time of play compared to time when there's nothing happening during a tennis match. Last question. So we know everyone calls you the mentalist, but what number am I thinking of right now between <laughs> one and 10? <laughs> Eight. <laughs> <laughs> it was. <laughs> now it was seven, bad luck. <laughs> Shit. That's it. Patrick, thank you for coming on to another episode of Good Trouble. I really appreciate your time and really do appreciate your help. It was an incredible pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. And you have one more fan for your channel. Thank you. I was already a fan of Nick Kyrgios, but now I'm a fan of the channel also. Perfect. Thank you, brother. Thank you. I thank appreciate you that. That was awesome. Yeah.